welcome viewers to this session. In this session, we will discuss in continuation to the first session of Mimansa philosophy. To recap what we had discussed in the last class, we said that there is a little bit background of Mimansa philosophy. There, we said that Jamini was the founder of Mimansa school. Then we find Swami Sambara or Sambara Swami, who has elaborated the Jamini text or the Jamini Sutra. Then followed to him, we find Kumari Lavatta, Prabhakara Misra, Murari Misra and many other scholars. We said that all the scholars contributed their thoughts, their analysis on different issues in relation to the soul, in relation to the world, in relation to the human beings existence. So, in if you put all together their views and their opinion on all these issues, we find the existence and the establishment of Mimansa philosophy. Then further we said that though many scholars contributed for the development and the growth of Mimansa philosophy, yet we found there are many differences among them on their opinions on some of the issues. Because Kumari Lavata accepts six pramanas. Pramanas means the valid source of knowledge. Kumari Lavata believes that if at all we get a valid knowledge, we need six sources. He accepts Naya pramanas. Naya four pramanas. These are perception, inference, comparison, testimony, and he adds two more. One is orthopathy postulation and another is Anupalabdi. Prabhakara Mishra did not agree with this six pramanas. He said that Anupalabdi or non-perception belongs to the perception. Therefore, he rejects Anupalabdi as an independent pramana among other pramana. Therefore, according to Prabhakara, there are only five pramanas, not six pramanas as like Kumarila Bhatta. They have also difference in their opinion regarding substance, regarding uh, padarthas or categories and so and so forth. And moving forward, we had discussed what is valid knowledge according to Mimansa philosophy. If you remember, we said that according to Mimansa philosophy, valid knowledge is that knowledge where a cognizer is known certain object which is new for him or her. And further, that knowledge cannot be contradicted with any other knowledge. And further, it should be free from all the defects, all other defects. So, therefore, three components you find if we analyze their concepts of valid knowledge. I repeat, they said that whenever we talk about a valid knowledge, it stands for prama, or in Sanskrit, we say prama, it is a valid knowledge. And for them, a valid knowledge is that knowledge where the cognizer is receiving some kind of new knowledge about some object, which he or she may not have received in his or her past time. Further, that knowledge should not be contradicted by any other sorts of knowledge. In addition to these two features, the third component is that should not have any other defects in it. And if these features are to be satisfied, then the knowledge that the cognizer is having or gaining, we call it a valid knowledge. While analyzing the concept valid knowledge, they said that to acquire the valid knowledge, to have or to possess the valid knowledge, one need to accept the pramanas, because without pramanas, prama is not possible. Pramana is the source where prama is the effect. Through pramana, we can achieve or acquire prama. So, therefore, one must know that what are the pramanas really responsible for acquiring the prama. So, in that regard, we had discussed that orthopathy postulation as an addition to nyayaka pramanas. As you know, that nyayaka said that four pramanas, perception, inference, comparison and testimony or verbal testimony. Kumarila Bhatta added two more, one is 
orthopathy postulation and another is onupalabdhi or non-perception. We had discussed what is orthopathy. While discussing the orthopathy, we said that Mimansa consider orthopathy is an independent pramana and they also strongly believe that orthopathy cannot be reduced to any of the pramanas, neither to perception, nor to inference, nor to comparison, nor to verbal testimony as well. Initially they said that by explaining orthopathy, they said that there is a proposition where we find two contradictory facts or two facts are contradicting with each other. So, in this regard to establish that fact as a cognizer, we need to postulate the third fact and here the third fact resolves the conflict between these two facts. Example that we had discussed that Devadatta is a guy fasting in a day time, but getting fatter and fatter. So, here you can find the contradiction. One is how is it possible that a person is fasting and getting fatter and fatter? And second you find that a person is fasting, not eating and no one has seen whenever he is taking food if at all, but people observe that how he becomes fatter and fatter. Is it possible that if somebody is go on fasting and the result will be fat and more fat? So, therefore, we find two facts and there is a contradiction. Again two sorts of contradiction we find. How is it the, the first contradiction, how is the case that a person not eating in the daytime and getting fat and fat? The second contradiction we find that is it the case that those who are fasting in the daytime can be bulker? Because here Devadatta is, is a fat man. So, by resolving the contradiction between these two facts, the fact in one hand that Devadatta is a person and an individual cannot be a bulkier if he or she does not eat so much food. But on the other hand, it is stated that he was fasting in the daytime and nobody had seen whether he is eating food in the night time or not. But here as a cognizer, he or she has to postulate a third fact as a result this contradiction can be resolved, contradiction can be solved. The third fact is known as that Devadatta is a person may be fasting in the daytime, but certainly eating huge amount of food in the night time. As a result he is getting much bulkier and bulkier, getting much fatter and fatter. So, if you try to reduce this pramana to any other pramana, what consequence we find? We had also discussed, it cannot be reduced to perception, because no one has seen whether he is eating in the night time or not, but people have observed that while fasting in the day time, he is getting fatter and fatter. Second, it cannot be reduced to upaman or comparison, because it is not the case that those who are fasting in the day time, they are getting fatter and fatter is like Devadatta. If this is so, then how can we compare Devadatta with other person who are not eating anything in the daytime and further they are not fat. The third pramana cannot be reduced to verbal testimony. There we said that each person has their different opinion on a particular fact or issue. Therefore, it is a very subjective in approach we cannot rely on any person's view, because to accept one's view you have to depend on others and that person has to depend on other, others. In this way it will go in a infinite regress and there should not be any point of time where we can claim that now this is the last and we can claim that, that this person is reliable. No, we cannot say so. Now, question arises can that orthopathy can be reduced to inference. We said that in inference we need a vyapta relation between middle term and major term between Hetu and Sadhya. And uh, what is their relation? Their relation is 
invariable, universal, inseparable and concomitant relation. And these kind of features we do not find if we frame the proposition and conclusion in the frame of argument. So, therefore, orthopathy cannot be reduced to inference. If at all it will be reduced to inference, then we will commit the error. That error is that it is a lack of depth relation we find between middle term and major term. And henceforth, it cannot be reduced to inferences. So, thus Kumarila Bhatta convinced to each and every one, to each and every thinkers that onupalabdhi or postulation is an independent pramana like other pramanas. For example, perception, inference, comparison and testimony. And today class, we will discuss the second pramana said by Viman Sikas and particularly Kumarila Bhatta. Though it is not agreed by Prabhakar Misra, still we will discuss why according to Kumarila Bhatta, Anupalabdi or non-perception can be considered as an independent pramana. Now, you have understood so far how orthopathy or postulation can be considered as an independent pramana. Now, let us understand what Kumarila Bhatta intended when he proposes that Anupalabdi or non-perception is an independent pramana. I must tell you that when he describes Anupalabdi, he is very much aware of the pramana known as perception or pratyakya stated by Nyayagaj, because he accepted that perception is an independent pramana and further also endorsed that non-perception is also an independent pramana. Now, it may be a question, may be some of the question arises in your mind that how is it the case that a person claiming perception is an independent pramana and the same time non-perception is an independent pramana. Is it not the case that non-perception comes under the perception? To resolve all this issue, he explain what he means by non-perception and how non-perception as a pramana is an independent pramana different from perception or different from perceptual knowledge. He said that perception is an pramana through which we can acquire the valid knowledge. In the same way, non-perception is an independent pramana through which we can acquire the valid knowledge. And this perception and non-perception, the two pramanas are different from each other. Now, let us understand in a very common sense point of view. Once we will have a common agreement of understanding of non-perception, then this will help us to understand Mimansika's stance point on the concept non-perception. What is non-perception? If I say that on my table there is no horse, I say that there is no horse on my table. Another example I will say there is no duster on my table. What I mean here is that there is an object duster may exist elsewhere, but at present the same duster does not exist on my table in a particular time. However, since I know the object duster, I can immediately perceive the non absence of duster on my table. I repeat. If I say there is no duster on my table, here I am perceiving the absence of duster on my table. I am perceiving the non-existence of that duster which I am referring to. The non-existence of that duster on my table. How can I perceive? I perceive because I know that that object may exist elsewhere, but at present, at present means at the particular time in a particular place like on my table, it is not there. Therefore, non-perception is certainly a different kind of pramana, it is not like a perception. In case of perception, it is said that look there is a duster on my table, therefore I can perceive it, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can see it, that is a direct perception. But in case of non-perception, you are seeing the absence of that object that is certainly a different one. In case of perception, we perceive the existence of the object 
but in case of non perception we perceive the non existence of the object. As I said there is no horse on my table, I know what is horse means, I know what horse supposed to do and I know what horse can do so and so forth. By knowing that I am telling I am perceiving now at present there is no horse on my table. So, the non perception of horse on my table stands as an independent proman. Now, the same thing in a logical way stated by Mimanshikas. Mimanshikas said that Anupalabdi is the immediate knowledge of the non existence of an object. I said there is non existence of duster on my table. He had to explain further what they mean really. An object does not exist in a particular place and in a particular time, but it exists elsewhere. An example I have given here, there is no book on the table. You can understand in the same spirit as I had discussed with you, there is no duster on my table. Further, all non perceptions are not the case of non existence. This is important here. All non perception are not the case of non existence. Whatever we perceive, we find that they have existence and whatever we not perceive, it is not so the case that it exists some other places. I repeat, whenever we perceive something, we know that that particular thing exists in a particular place, in a particular time. But whenever I am referring to the non-existence of an object, it does not mean that that object exists some, some other places we can verify that. No, an example I will give like dharma, punctuality, desirability, these are the concept. We cannot refer to a particular object like table and chair in this case, but whenever I am say that dharma persists, dharma pervades everywhere, one should perform his duties. So, in all the cases I cannot refer to a particular object. If I say that honesty is desirable, what to refer? But certainly it exists, it exists in the form of concept, not in the form of object. Therefore, they said, Mimanshikas clearly said that all non perception are not the case of non existence. Whenever we talk about dharma, whenever we talk about desire, whenever we talk about honesty, punctuality, all these things though it does not exist like a table and chair, but it exists in the form of concepts. Therefore, we can perceive the non existence of that object, although it does not have a physical existence like table and chair in this world. Therefore, we must admit that there are many things exist in this world in the form of solid objects, where we can perceive those things and there are many things exist in this world in the form of concept that we cannot refer to as like we refer to many so tangible objects, many durable objects. Thus, the summit the view that do not consider that whenever you are non perceiving some issues or some object on a particular place, it does not mean that it exists elsewhere. For example, I repeat I said that honesty is desirable and if I say that now you are not showing your honesty and here I can perceive the non honesty of that person, but certainly that non honesty we may not find in other places, because non honesty is not an object where we can refer to that it is like table and chair. In this way we have to understand non perception and certainly it is a different from the perception which is an independent pramana. Further they said according to Advaita Vedanta, because Mimansa and Advaita Vedanta constitute a pair, Mimansa talks about Karma Kanda, where Advaita Vedanta talks about Jnana Kanda and both are interrelated with each other. Advaita Vedanta said that Yoga Anupalabdi means appropriate non perception which entails that something exists somewhere, it is capable of being perceived, but not perceived. 
what Advaita Vedanta argued over here is that, that something we perceive as a non-existence in a particular place and in a particular time. But at present you cannot perceive it, but if you wish to perceive it, you can perceive that object elsewhere. That is what Advaita Vedanta explains, when they try to explain Anupalabdhi, non-perception and independent pramana. They said that, we can perceive the non-existence of duster on my table, but if I wish, I can perceive that duster some other places, maybe inside my drawer, I can perceive it. Therefore, they said that, it is capable of being perceived, we can perceive it whenever we want, mm -hmm. but at present, it is not perceived. So, this therefore, it is an unique pramana. For them, Brahman is possible when we are knowing it by being it. What is Brahman for them? Brahman is the ultimate person who really creates the whole universe, who really helps for the growth and progress of all the objects in this earth, both animate and non-animate objects. Further, it also assists in the destruction of all objects. So, therefore, he is really controlling the beginning and the end of all the objects, both animate and non-animate in this earth. By explaining the concept Brahman, Advaita Vedanta accepts that Brahman exists. If there will be no Brahman, how can everything will be go in a uniform way? How can we find the tranquility in the society? How can we find the ethical life in human society? How can we find that sun rises in the east every day and sets in the west? How can we find the day after night and night after day? How can we find the circle? So, there must be someone who is controlling each and everything. How can we find the uniformity that whenever there is a sun rises, we find the sun rays in the earth. We can able to see all the objects in this world. But whenever there is a sun sets, we find all the birds, animals go back to their rest place. And once the evening approaches, we could not able to see any of the objects, because darkness pervades everywhere. And the same thing appears in the next time. How it happens? Who really controls all this? So, therefore, Adhita Vedanta believes that though we cannot perceive the Brahman, like there is no duster on my table, though we cannot perceive Brahman at present, but it can be perceived in the way that we perceive honesty, we perceive punctuality, we perceive some other concepts. Thus, Advaita Vedanta said and agreed that we need or we have an independent pramana that is known as non-perception or anupalabdhi. Moving further, Anupalabdhi cannot be reduced to any other pramanas. To argue that Anupalabdhi is an independent pramana, we must claim that, that it cannot be reduced to any other pramanas. Because Prabhakara Mimansa said that non-perception can come under the perception, because since perception is an independent pramana, non-perception come under it. Therefore, there will be no point to argue that non-perception is an independent pramana. What Prabhakara Mimansa said that non-perception at best you can claim that it is a non-existence of something on some places, which can be perceived some other places. However, Kumarila Vata did not agree with that, neither Adhita Vedantis. They said that if you cannot perceive something which is supposed to be perceived on a particular place, then certainly it is a different perception. Here, Kumari Lapata argue that we perceive the non-existence of existence. Please remember the sentence, I said that according to Kumari Lapata, non-perception is an independent pramana, because they perceive the non-existence of existence of an object. They perceive the non-existence of existence of an object. As I said, I perceive the non-existence of duster, which can be perceived 
later period because it exists elsewhere. Therefore, the non existence of existence of duster on my table, I have perceived it. In this way, they said that Anupalabdhi cannot be reduced according to Kumarila Vatta, Anupalabdhi cannot be reduced to any of this independent pramana that we find like perception, inference, comparison and verbal testimony. Why it cannot be reduced to perception? Because in case of perception, we perceive the direct object. If you say that there is a pain on my table, I perceive the object and I know its different features and I know it is hard, it solves some of the purpose, I have also used it, I know these are the, the features of the pain and so on and so forth. Therefore, I can claim that this is a perception, but here we are perceiving something in an absence of that object. So, therefore, it cannot be reduced to perception. Now, can it be reduced to upamana or comparison? It cannot be reduced to comparison, because to have comparison, to have the pramana upamana, we need the perception as a foundation for having a pramana like upamana. What is upamana is about? That you have an analogy, you have a comparison. Whenever you try to compare two things, then you need to perceive that thing. And since it does not talk about the perception, it talks about non perception, therefore, Anupalabdi cannot be reduced to Upamana. Now, can it be reduced to verbal testimony? Here, people said that, and Kumarila Bhatta argued that it cannot be reduced to verbal testimony because, in case of verbal testimony, we have to believe to a reliable person, and they have defined who can be a reliable person. But here, how can we believe? on someone who can able to explain the non existence of existence of an object, if the cognizer not able to perceive that object as such. For example, if I do not know what is a duster, how can I perceive the non existence of duster on my table? How can I believe someone as a reliable person able to explain something about the non existence of duster on my table? Therefore, it cannot be reduced to verbal testimony. Now, the question remains that can it be reduced to inference. Again, Kumari Lapata said that if at all we will reduce it to the inference, then we will commit an error, and that error is nothing but that lack of vyapta relation between middle term and major term, between Hetu and Sadhya. And where the defects lies? The defects lies in Vyapta relation, because to have an inference, we need a Vyapta relation. And here, Vyapta relation cannot be established in a concrete way. And the error lies when we said that, we do not find everywhere that all non perception are not the case of non existence. Please remember, please understand the concept, why we do not find the Vyapta relation if we try to reduce anupalabdhi or non perception into inference. The problem lies in this way that we do not find everywhere that all non perception are not the case of non existence. All non perceptions are existence. Is it the case that whatever we are talking about non perception of object all are referring to existence in somewhere or some point. Is it the case that whenever we talk about non perception, we find the existence of it? Suppose I talk about say, there is no duster on my table, here the duster can be found in somewhere, but if I say that honesty is desirable or if I say I do not find honesty on you, how can I find the word honesty, which may lie some other places like table and chair. Therefore, they said that like a smoke and fire, we find everywhere, there will be no exception, wherever there is a smoke, there is a fire. But here, we find the differences that in all the places, we do not find that, 
whenever we talk about, whenever we perceive about non perception, that non perception refers to something perceived object in a later period. If this is so, then how can we establish the Vipti relation between Hetu and Sadhya? What it demands is that, that Hetu and Sadhya should be invariably, inseparably, universally and concomitantly related with each other, but here we do not find so. There are many situations where we find whenever we talk about non-existence of something or the non-perception, our perception towards the non-existence of an existed object that may find some other places like a duster. But there are many other cases as well, whenever we perceive the non-existence of that concept that may not find in other places as well. So, therefore, the lake of Vyapta relation really stands as in hurdles if we try to reduce Anupal of the non-perception to inference. Therefore, Anupal of the according to Kumari Lavatta and Adwaita Vedanta is an independent pramana among other pramanas. It has its unique existence and in this case also the cognizer able to know certain object which is new for him or her certainly may not be knowing that thing in the past in his or her past that object is new for him or her. If I say that I do not find honesty on him or her here the cognizer identifying or perceiving the non honesty in a person on a particular time and further if he or she wants to find out that honesty some other places, he needs the explanation of it. He may not able to refer to a particular object like table and chair, but he can able to understand what honesty means. Therefore, in a very broader explanation they said that non perception is an independent pramana like other pramanas, perception, inference, comparison and verbal testament. Thus, it is an independent pramana for cognizing objects according to Kumari Lavatta. Now, question arises, whether the knowledge received through pramana is valid in itself or it demands any further proof for determining its validity. Any knowledge that we received through pramana, whether it is valid in itself or we need any further proof for validating that pramana. There are two question comes, is it the case that whatever knowledge we gain or whatever knowledge we acquire by the help of pramana, is it valid in itself or we need any further proof to validate that knowledge. The same thing I have refuted in other words, I said is it that knowledge valid in itself or is it the case that one source generates knowledge and another gives evidence for its validity. Is it that knowledge is valid in itself or is it the case that one source generates knowledge and another gives evidence of its validity. So, these two questions will be answered by Mimansa philosophy when that deals with the concept Pramanyavada. Therefore, they say that Pramanyavada deals with this concept. Now, what is Pramanyavada? Let us discuss. There are two Pramanyas we found in the Indian philosophical system. What are those two? One is Sattva Pramanavada and another is Paratta Pramanavada. Sattva stands for intrinsic and Paratta stands for extrinsic. So, therefore, they said that there are two kinds of Pramanya we find Sattva Pramanya and Paratta Pramanya. Sattva Pramanya stands for intrinsic validity. and Paratta Pramana stands for extrinsic validity. That means, the knowledge will be valid or invalid may be known through its intrinsic quality and on the other hand, the knowledge will be valid or not, it will be known through the external quality or through the external conditions. Pramana talks about, about the knowledge, valid knowledge, pramanyavada, the validity of knowledge. So, here we find there are two kinds of, one is knowledge is valid because of its intrinsic in 
nature and further knowledge is valid because it depends on the external condition. So, Sutta stands for intrinsic and Paratta stands for extrinsic. And once we have discussed about Pramanyavada, there is a other side of it that is Apramanyavada, that means invalidity of knowledge that we will also discuss. Because if a knowledge cannot be valid, then this will be turned into invalid knowledge. And for invalid knowledge, they said it is Apramanyavada. So, Pramanyavada in one hand expresses about the validity of knowledge. On the other hand, Apramanya talks about the invalidity of knowledge. And in both the cases, we find the Sutta and Paratta Pramanyavada and Sutta and Paratta Apramanyavada. What I mean is that a knowledge will be valid or invalid. It depends on the intrinsic and extrinsic conditions of it. On the other hand, if a knowledge will be invalid, it also depends on intrinsic and extrinsic conditions of it. Now, let us discuss what are the schools accept, what are the views and how they justify their views. And if at all they justify their view, what is the view of Kumarila Bhatta in this regard? Whether Kumarila Bhatta agrees with them or he has a different opinion on his own. Some school believe that the validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the matter which is capable of producing the object. Many schools, if you see, now what are those schools that we will discuss. But now for the, for the understanding, we need to know that what the really intrinsic validity means, how a knowledge can be valid intrinsically. Many of the schools said that the validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the matter which is capable of producing the object. In the matter, we find something validity and invalidity and because of the validity in the matter, whatever it produces, it turns into a valid. If the matter which is capable of produce the effects, if it is not valid, then whatever effect it produces or whatever effects it produces, it turns into invalid. Therefore, they say that validity and invalidity lies in the material objects which is capable of producing many of the effects. For example, if the clay is not valid, how can we find pot which is a production from clay will be valid. If the thread is not valid, how can we find the cloth will be a valid one, because cloth produced from thread, here thread is the material. So, therefore, they said that the effect the knowledge will be valid or invalid, it depends on its matters from which it produces. They said that categorically that validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the matter which is capable of producing the objects. When we identify the object, we know that object and as a result we acquire the knowledge about that object. Please understand it clearly. It is a very logical argument. They said that validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the material in the material which is capable of produce objects. And whenever it is capable of produce object, we know about that object and therefore, we acquire the knowledge about that object. Therefore, the validity and invalidity lies intrinsically in that matter. On the other hand, some schools believe that before producing anything, before we see anything in this world, we cannot accept its validity or invalidity. Because whenever we identify an object, there is a sense organs contact between that object and the sense organs. Here, what is claimed is that whenever we perceive some object, our sense organs contact to that object. So, there is a contact between the object and the sense organs. And as you know that the sense organs may deceive us, because of various reasons. Suppose, I want to see a duster on my table, here depends on the distance where the duster lies, it also varies. 
my perception varies. If my vision side is not healthy, if I do not have a proper vision side, I may see the duster in a different way or if I see the duster in a different angle, the duster looks to me in a different way. Further, if there is no proper light, I cannot able to see the duster as it is. I may see the duster in a different way, where the nature of duster is not so. Therefore, it is stated that whether the knowledge is valid or not, it depends on the external condition. Before the production of that object, we may not know anything about that matter. Although we know about the matter, but we do not know whether it, the matter is valid or invalid. The valid or invalid, we can able to know only when our sense organs contact to that object and could able to know that whether that object can be named with so and so, whether that object can be fulfilled some purposes or not. So, therefore, some of the thinkers from some of the schools, they believe that the validity and invalidity of knowledge an object on thing or an issue or an event depends on many of the external conditions. Like to validate the existence of a duster on my table, I need some of the external conditions like I must have proper vision sight, further there must be a sufficient light to perceive that object and the duster should be kept in a minimum distance where I can perceive that object. It should not be kept far away from me and there may be many other. Thus, I submit that according to Mimansika that we find there are two kinds of validity or pramanyavada, validity of knowledge. One is Sattva Pramanyavada, another is Paratva Pramanyavada. Sattva Pramanyavada talks about the intrinsic validity, the knowledge will be intrinsic valid in its nature and on the other hand some of the knowledge will be valid or invalid, it depends on the external conditions. It is in a very broader framework. Same thing I have written here, I said that on the other hand some school opined that we acquire the knowledge of an object when there is a, a contact between the object and the sense organs. This generates the doubt because there are many extraneous conditions matter while judging an object. Example I have given that while identifying a pot we need to have good vision, proper light, accurate distance, so and so forth. Thus, knowledge is not self evident, its validity and invalidity depends on external factors. Any knowledge can be known to be false by the cognizer only when it is contradicted by some other knowledge. If you recapitulate what we have said, that Miman seekers believes that that valid knowledge are those knowledge where it should not contradict by any other knowledge. The same thing I have repeated here. This is one among the other elements of valid knowledge. Thus, we find if I will have the four combinations Pramanyavada, Pramanyavada and Sattva Pramanyavada and Paratva Pramanyavada, then we find four forms of Pramanyavada. One is Sattva Pramanyavada, intrinsic validity, another is Sattva Pramanyavada intrinsic invalidity. The third one is Paratta Pramanyavada that is extrinsic validity and the last one is Paratta Pramanyavada that is extrinsic invalidity. Therefore, we have four forms of Pramanyavada, Sattva Pramanyavada, Sattva Pramanyavada, Paratta Pramanyavada, Paratta Pramanyavada. Now, according to Mimansa as I said or Kumarila Bhatta, Sattva Pramanyavada and Paratta Pramanyavada. I had discussed just few minutes back, why it is a Sattva Pramanyavada? Because the belief that a thing or a knowledge will be valid or invalid, it depends on its matters, which is capable of producing the effects or producing the objects. If the matter is not intrinsically valid, then whatever it produces, it cannot be valid. If the clay is not good, if the clay is not valid, then whatever pot will produce, it certainly does not solve the purposes. Therefore, according to Mimansikas, the validity and invalidity of knowledge 
lies in the matter. Further they said that parata pramanyavada extrinsic invalidity, what they mean that if at all a object the knowledge about an object is invalid, it depends on the external condition parata, because there are many external conditions matters to identify an object to have a knowledge about that object. Therefore, according to Mimansa a knowledge will be valid, because it is sutta pramanya, it lies in its in its matter, the validity lies in its matter sutta pramanya. Parata pramanya a knowledge will be invalid, because of the external condition. In the same way Sankhya philosophy said sattva pramanya and sattva pramanya. Sattva pramanya means sattva the validity of knowledge lies in the matter as is like Kumarila Bhatta sattva pramanya vada. Further they said that that invalidity of knowledge also lies in the matter because if the matter is invalid whatever it produces certainly it will be invalid it does not require any kind of external conditions for its invalidity. Therefore, while accepting the Kumarila water view that knowledge can be valid, because it lies in some matter, they said that knowledge can be invalid, because if the invalidity lies in its matter. Thus, in one point Sankhya agreed with Kumarila Bhatta, but in other point disagree with Kumarila Bhatta. The disagreement lies when Sankhya philosophy talks about sattva pramanya vada. That means, invalidity of knowledge also lie in the matter. The Buddhist also said parattva pramanya and sattva pramanya. When Buddhist talks about parattva pramanya, they said that because of the external conditions, we identify that object, we have a knowledge about that object. Therefore, the validity of a knowledge about an object depends on the external condition. And further they said sattva pramanya vada, that means the invalidity of knowledge lies because of the matter, which is capable of producing it. If the matter is invalid, whatever way it produce any object, it cannot be valid. Therefore, to access validity and invalidity of knowledge, we need the external condition and not the matter as such. Further, if you consider the Nyayaka's view, they said that parattva pramanya vada and parattva pramanya vada, I think will a knowledge will be valid or invalid, it depends on the external condition, the way you perceive the object. If the object is perceived as it is, then it is a valid knowledge, but if you perceive snake as a rope or rope as a snake, it is an invalid knowledge. So, therefore, because of the external conditions, we could not able to cognize the object. Therefore, the validity and invalidity of knowledge lies in the external condition. I repeat that Kumarila Bhatta talks about sattva pramanya vada and parattva pramanya vada. Sankhya philosophy talks about sattva pramanya vada, sattva apramanya vada and Buddhist philosophy talks about parattva pramanya vada and sattva apramanya vada. And the last one the Nayakas talks about parattva pramanya and parattva apramanya. Now, we will see how really Mimansikas agrees to all the views given by other schools whether Mimansika's philosophy agrees to all those views or they have reservation on their own. We will discuss in the next class. Thank you.